Hi, my name is Niccolo Piazza. I'm an interventional cardiologist from Canada. And today I'm joined by some international colleagues, Stephen Worthley from Australia and Wolfgang Rappbauer from Germany. And we're going to have an informative discussion about the high-life transcatheter mitral valve system delivered through a transeptal approach. So before we uh, begin with our discussion, um, perhaps it'd be a good idea just to go over uh, exactly what is the high life system uh, and what are its components. So the, the high life concept really is a valve in ring concept. And so we need to deliver a ring through the transfemoral arterial approach, followed by the valve deployment through a transeptal uh, delivery approach. Now, very importantly, in order uh, to perform the procedure, we need to uh, perform three uh, important steps. Uh, that is uh, move across the aortic valve and um, obtain uh, loop placement around the mitral valve leaflets, followed by ring delivery over um, the looping guide wire. And finally, we deploy a valve across the ring. Now, in, in order to perform these three steps, it's very important um, that we use certain imaging uh, protocol. And what you see here on the screen are, are, is really the secret formula to uh, performing the high life procedure. Uh, what we use as a foundation are the echocardiographic chamber views. Um, and what we then do is we use patient-specific CT scans in order to translate the echocardiographic chamber views, that is the short axis, the two chamber, the three chamber and the four chamber, um, through the use of CT, we can create fluoroscopic patient specific chamber views. And as you can see on the table, uh, these different chamber views are used in succession across the three steps for the high life procedure. So uh, just in summary, we use the one chamber, two chamber, and three chamber view for looping and ring placement. And the final uh, stage of the procedure, that is valve deployment, is performed in the four chamber view. So Steve, perhaps maybe you can uh, give us a, a little um, explanation of exactly how we perform the guide wire looping. And in doing so, maybe you can also Tell us about the your your own learning curve um, about doing this step of the procedure. Oh, thanks, Nico. And look, you've elegantly broken it down into those three simple steps. The first of which is is looping around the caudal structures under the mitral valve, so that you have a, a framework upon which you can then deliver that subannular implant or ring. And it's, it's quite easy to remember, Nico. Uh, the first part we do in the, in the one chamber, the second part of the looping we do in the two chamber, and the third part we do in the three chamber. But if, if what you'll see here is that the, the aptly named um, loop placement catheter, LPC, uh, is placed just ventricular side of the aortic valve. Uh, we're careful not to cause any trauma to it. Uh, the nose cone of that system is free from, from that delivery system. And then there are these two hypotubes uh, inside there. And the first of those, we use a Terumo glide wire to start the process of encapsulating all of the cords. So on that first image, what you'll importantly see in this one chamber view, as we're looking up through the left ventricle, is we want the Terumo wire to be to the left of screen. So it's, we want it to be along the medial side and moving down. And we can see that very well in that one chamber view. As we start to move that Terumo glide wire around up um, the lateral wall, we then move to the two chamber view. So we then are looking through the atrioventricular groove, vent left ventricle to the right, the left atrium to the left. And in this plane, what we wanna do is make sure that we've got the Terumo glide wire staying just underneath or just ventricular side of the mitral valve. So ideally the wire is, is positioned a little bit to the left of screen. So a little bit to the left atrial side. And all the while, as we're advancing the Terumo glide wire, we're backing it up with the hypotube behind it to give us some support. Then in the third step, as we see that wire come around into the outflow tract, we use that three chamber view so that we've now got a good, um, a good representation of where the left ventricular outflow tract is. 
we can then pass that trumoglide glide wire back up into the outflow track and through the aortic valve. Uh, and from there, we've now know that we've been able to capture all of the cord structures. Uh, we've got some, some tips and tricks as to ensure how we haven't missed any cords and how we might not have got any false cords. But that little three steps is basically how you do looping. Steve, are there any similarities to... Uh like say moving a coronary guide wire through the uh, coronaries? I think that's a great analogy. Actually, that's, that's pretty much what it's like. Um, you know, we've, uh, we want to make sure we can manipulate, especially in that middle two chamber view. Uh, we need to ensure that the, the tip of the glide of the trumo glide is facing atrially because the risk is, as you start to come up the lateral wall, it can dive into the left ventricle. So, so good coronary te um, techniques are really all you need to be able to successfully uh, do the looping. Yeah, and I can imagine that the importance is really to keep that wire high up in the submitral groove. Um, and these views, of course, guide you uh, in keeping that guide wire in the correct location. Yeah. You know, I, I remember before we had this uh, one chamber, two chamber and three chamber view, um, you know, the guide wire looping would take us uh, quite a while. Uh, but once we institute, uh, instituted this uh, protocol, um, Stephen, you know, can you just give us an idea of how long, what's been the, you know, the shortest times and the sort of the longest times that, that you've had for looping? Yeah. Well, look, I, Nico, I remember well our very first case and it, uh, it, it, it took quite a while. But to your point, uh, that we, we were really learning uh, the concept. We, much of that we did in the one chamber view. Uh, and we we just we didn't know actually when the when the wire was diving into the ventricle, so not staying up underneath the valve. So the the utilization of these other views has really simplified it. And look, I think now, uh, and as you know, Nick, I, I haven't done millions of cases, but you know, eight or nine cases. You know, it really this is a a five ten minute procedure and process. Uh, it's done carefully, uh, but it's it's not difficult when you know what you're looking at and. Um, and to deliver and get a good successful outcome, I think, has now become quite reproducible. Uh, Wolfgang, can you please uh, give us your experience with looping and your learning curve? Yeah, er, certainly. It's a pleasure to address that. Uh, Stephen pointed out um, that it's a very, um, and seems to be a very complicated, but it's a rather very structured process not, right now. And I think we started in Ulm in our first case with a looping time of one and a half hours, and, and we got it down to, to maybe 10 to 30 minutes, depending on the patients. So once the procedure was structured well, um, you see a very steep learning curve and, 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 and very short um, intervention times. Okay. And Steve, uh, perhaps we can move on uh, to the ring deployment, uh, because that's the second step of the procedure. Uh, but before we do that, I guess we need to confirm our wire position. Um, and, and how do you assess that? Yeah, that's a great question. Look, it's, and it's quite a simple concept, and it's that of cinching. It's interesting, Nico, as we saw before, we do use uh, a lot of fluoroscopic views. That's what I was, we were showing you there, and they are, they are how most of the procedure is done. But once we've got the, the wire, in theory, encapsulating all of the caudal structures, what we can then do after we've captured the wire and we've exteriorized it, we can tension that whole system. And by looking at the 3D tresophageal echocardiographic image, if the wire's in the perfect spot, captured all the cords that we want and got no false cords, we should be able to see that as we cinch it by tensioning it, that then the actual orifice of the wire is, is um, made smaller and it stays circular. If there's a false cord that's caught, we'll see a teardrop type of, of appearance. Uh, and if we miss cords, as we tension it, we'll see parts of the mitral valve orifice not be tensioned in. So okay. uh, certainly that is, once again, that's, that's actually really quite a simple and straightforward step. Okay, and Steve, perhaps if you can just give us a little uh, rundown about how you deploy the ring, um, and then maybe we can move over to valve deployment. Sounds good, Nick. This is, now that you've got the loop around, um, the, the subangular implant, the ring is quite simple. Uh, it's an elegant design. Basically, on the two exteriorized ends of that Terumo glide wire, which is 300 centimetres, you put the two ends of what will become the ring. So it's actually like a long tube, and the ends will eventually then um, 
intersusceptible to each other with a one-way valve type structure so it can't come back out. So that system is placed down. You'll actually see in the middle image that, in fact, what you do is you'll be able to tension that system. You drag the ends of the ring into each other. As I say, they intersuscept inside each other. And then there's a, a mechanism whereby they cannot come back out. The ring has been deployed. Okay. So um, then we move on to the final step of the procedure, which is done in a four-chamber view uh, with the atrial septum and mitral valve in plane. Can you give us the three simple steps uh, that are performed during valve deployment? Yes. Well, look, there's, there's, a, there's a, a number of them, but look, the first one, obviously, I mean, we've now safely positioned that our transeptal puncture, safely positioned the wire across there. Uh, once we've got the, the valve itself through the subannular implant, uh, what we will firstly do is then we'll release the left ventricular component of the valve frame. That flowers and opens up. Secondly, we will then tension that back so that it brings the ring and that ventricular part of the frame right up against the annulus. Uh, and we do a left ventricular gram to ensure we're in the right position for that. Third and finally, once we're comfortable, we keep that tension on there. We release the left atrial component of the stent frame, which then opens and deploys. And you've actually got, with the hourglass system and the ring right in the middle of it, you've got a very secure delivered transcatheter mitral valve replacement. Okay, thank you, Steve. Now, once we've performed uh, the procedure, perhaps uh, Wolfgang, can you give us some insights um, on the um, you know patient management across um, you know the pre-procedural, intra-procedural, and post-procedural steps of the procedure? Yeah, I think um, thanks, Nico. Um, there are two important things. So um, um, you highlighted that already. We are using CT scanning to pre-screen the patients and 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 to make them conformable to the study um, design. And, um, and as highlighted in the slide, we see we also use this CT scanning not only for um, 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 placing the wire and, and getting the um, um, chamber views, but also um, for planning a precise uh, transeptal puncture. And you see here two imaging, so B cable view and a kind of four chamber view where in, 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 in pink, um, the transeptal puncture site is highlighted. And when you then move forward um, in the procedure, we use um, echo guidance um, again um, um, to, to, to puncture that site. And in the end, um, I think this is an important step to be highlighted. The balloon dilation of the septum has to be done very carefully and not with a balloon that is too big. So we usually use a 10 millimeter balloon to, to carefully dilate um, the septum. And in the end, um, this ends in a defect in, in the septum that so far, and, and, and I think we, we overlook now more than 40 patients that were successfully implanted through the transeptal route um, where the um, um, ASD did not have to be occluded uh, by a device um, um, acutely. So the, the other issue maybe regarding the, the procedure and the pacing management is hemodynamic management um, of the patients. And I think this is very important because at first the procedure seems to be kind of tricky and complicated, but in the end, everything is very quiet and stable and everything is well thought during the procedure. But I think to, to, to highlight that, and, and, and we uh, and the two of us um, did already point that out, that we have a catheter in the first step of the procedure crossing the aorta retrogradely. And this catheter might induce some aortic regurg. And, and so before you start wire looping, you should uh, clearly focus on that judge that and might uh, use vasopressors or, or inotropic substances or chronotropic substances that might stabilize the patient on the table. Usually it's not a problem. And a second um, 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 procedural step where we have to watch out for hemodynamics for sure is the deployment um, of the valve. And, and I think um, there we usually start with good hemodynamics. And while we release the atrial portion, as Stephen already pointed out, um, 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 of the valve, usually we have a drop um, in, in, in systolic blood pressure because the atrial 
um, um, contraction doesn't move any blood any longer for a, a couple seconds towards the left ventricle. Okay, thank you, Wolfgang. So um, as we have seen um, that we have um, gone over some of the important uh, steps of the procedure, um, I think it, we, we can summarize it in three easy steps. We have looping around the mitral valve, we have ring deployment, we have valve deployment through a transeptal approach. Uh, imaging is very important. Um, and we have to take into account, uh, of course, the hemodynamics uh, during the procedure uh, that lead us to a, a successful uh, patient outcome. Wolfgang, can you also tell us about valve performance and that how, and how that's looked like uh, after the procedure? Yeah, we were very curious during the study to see how the valve performs. And then you see there an, an echo slide in the summary of the follow-up regarding mitral regurg. And as, as you see, we basically have no regurg on, 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 on these patients' um, follow-up um, regarding the valve itself, but also the paravalvular um, connection between um, the valve and the ring is very tight. So paravalvular regurgitation is not an issue in these patients. Thank you very much. So I'd like to thank my colleagues uh, for today's discussion about the uh, transeptal high life uh, transcatheter mitral valve replacement system. And I hope to see you in, at your OPCR in Paris.